Hi everyone. Uh, so we have another lecture today. So first of all, I started with some of your suggestions. Some of you wanted to get a, a beach background. So there you go. We have a beach background. Also symbolizes the fact that last week I was supposed to be in Hawaii on the beach. This is supposed to be beach from Hawaii. It's either a Hawaii beach or a very bad Photoshop of Hawaii beach. I'm not sure about that since I haven't been to Hawaii. But that's what we have uh, for today. And I hope it's uh, good. If you have more suggestions, you're more than welcome to uh, send me some ideas. Um, one quick thing before I start today's lecture, um, I will send later tonight or tomorrow another video. The same thing with the YouTube channel, everything is going to be the same. That's going to be the video for uh, the final task, the paper and the presentation. It's going to be a short one, about 10, 12 minutes, something like this, tops, even less. Uh, I will give you some pointers about what I want to do, what I expect to do, and uh, those kinds of things, instead of uh, just trying to do a very long email that's going to be too much of you to read. So uh, that's going to come uh, later on today. So let's start with today's topic. Uh, I'll just put the slides on. There you go. Today we'll talk about uh, state sponsorship of uh, terrorism. Uh, before we begin, uh, as usual, we'll do a quick review on the, the stuff we had for um, Friday's lecture, actually, because uh, Monday you had uh, the movie, which I hope you saw. Uh, it had some interesting points. Both movies, the PBS shorter one and the longer one, both of them were uh, kind of interesting. So I hope you like that. On uh, Friday, we did a, I did a pretty long lecture uh, combining uh, the main uh, groups of uh, uh, jihadi terrorism, Al Qaeda and uh, ISIS. So we started, started talking about, I started talking about Al Qaeda, the origins in Afghanistan, how we shifted the focus to uh, the US uh, attacks over the 90s, culminating in the attack, of course, in, in the United States in 9-11, and the current challenges, uh, mostly uh, due to the state, to the global system based on states. Uh, which led to the main uh, feature of Al-Qaeda over the last uh, 10 or 15 years, which is franchising. Uh, the goal of uh, franchising and allowing Al-Qaeda to keep the control in, the, in those areas. And the risks such as diverging interest between the local group and the, uh, the leadership of Al-Qaeda. Uh, the fact that the, the leadership has to, uh, has to uh, delegate the authority actually to the local franchise and that may lead to those diverging interests and the problems with that, the harm that those kinds of uh, uh, local affiliates do to the transnational ideology that Al-Qaeda had. So we talked about all those things. Then some of the actions that Al-Qaeda does to counter that uh, with the name of those franchises, usually not related to, this, to the country in which they operate, but more to the area or the fact that they tend to extend their operations beyond those uh, local areas. Uh, then I mentioned a couple of points about the potential revival of Al-Qaeda over the last uh, two or three years, mostly the demise of ISIS, which allowed a lot more recruitment, and the local structural conditions in places like uh, uh, Syria and the Middle East overall, weak, gov weak Arab governments, the fact that the American forces are uh, uh, coming out of the Middle East oldest will allow Al-Qaeda to revive uh, allegedly in the future. Then we move to talk about ISIS, the number one franchise that Al Qaeda was able to uh, to establish. Its origins in Iraq, how it actually uh, separated itself uh, from Al Qaeda and became an independent organization around 2013 to 2014. The very different approach that uh, ISIS took, more a much more violent approach, mobilizing the civil society of the Muslims as part of their goal. The expansion over 2014, 2015, until and which led to the counteroffensive by the West uh, and the loss of territory until today. Today, Al Qaeda, uh, ISIS, I'm sorry, is mostly like a medium-sized ins insurgency force. The main strength of ISIS as a terror group and its ability to innovate and to adapt and evolve, which call, which the main example for that is the its use of the media for information warfare and the online media for uh, expanding its uh, its influence. Uh, I talked about the virtual caliphate, the virtual planner model, which was uh, implemented in the attacks in Paris, which, uh, and how those things allowed it to win even more support globally, not just in their own area, and increase recruitment, recruitment again, recruitment not just for the Middle East, but for throughout the world, there's the ability to recruit to the jihad uh, movement. Uh, other enabling structural factors in Syria and Iraq, all of them allowing to the emergence of potential uh, uh, resurgence of ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and all the groups of the Jihad. So though that was a pretty long lecture talking about that, but 
I wanted to get you a sense of where we are standing today with those groups and uh, some of the things that they did in the past. So if you have any questions, as always, uh, you're more than welcome to email them uh, to me. So today we'll talk about state sponsorship. So first of all, what are we talking about when we're talking about state sponsorship? It's mostly uh, states that uh, uh, support uh, in the sense of providing access to uh, economic uh, resources, military resources, uh, diplomatic resources, intelligence resources. Those, this kind of support in turn translates to better and more advanced weaponry, uh, training, uh, and the access to information, classified information, a safe haven for those terror groups, they'll be able to, uh, to be safe from any kind of external forces attacking them, and a lot of logisticals and uh, support uh, from infiltration from other forces. So that's what actually it means. But one of the interesting questions in this case is this is kind of a puzzle. Why would a state, what's the uh, benefits for states? Why would a state conduct this kind of uh, affairs sponsorship when there are a social, there's a lot of risk associated with that. So let's look at those things, trying to understand why do states decide to uh, engage in sponsorship of terrorism? So the first, uh, the first question in this case, or the first point which raises this as a puzzle, it's there is, there's direct as well as indirect reprisals for uh, support. So of course, the American invasion to Afghanistan due to its support, uh, Al-Qaeda. In Libya, the American strikes, the West strikes and the attacks on Libya through to Gaddafi's support for terrorism in Europe of the 1980s. The vast economic sanction Iran has been suffering, which part of them, are due to its support for groups such as Hezbollah and Hamas. Uh, and last one is, uh, in this case, is Sudan, which was attacked multiple times by the United States and pressured by Egypt for harboring uh, bin Laden and his uh, associates from Al-Qaeda. So there are direct and indirect costs for sponsoring terrorism. Still, why would they do that? Other uh, puzzles in this case is the fact that state sponsorship does not provide necessarily efficient results. Uh, terror groups may be an unreliable ally and will not fulfill their promises. They may cancel missions, not complete their missions, promote their own agenda and clash with the sponsor. Uh, there's uh, research that shows that the long-term benefits are not really clear in most cases of uh, countries supporting terrorism. And the clear examples for that is India and its support for the LTTE, the Tamil Tigers, which uh, operated in India. So they cooperated early on uh, when the Tamil Tigers started uh, operating in Sri Lanka. Uh, the approaching uh, peace deal with Sri Lanka that the Tamil Tiger had uh, led to military clashes and between India and the terror group and eventually a suicide attack which killed the uh, Indian Prime Minister Gandhi in 1991. So the results eventually for India were not that supportive. So why exactly did they decide to do that? The third point here is the reputation and image costs, again, for the sponsoring state. Uh, providing support for groups uh, may create damages for its supporters due to the policies of the group. Uh, mostly external support uh, makes more, most terror groups less sensitive to uh, indiscriminate civil targeting. If the group is able to generate support from a state, not necessarily where they operate, then they don't have to be that sensitive to harming citizens or civilians. So they are much more uh, lethal in this case, and there's a lot more damages in this case, which can eventually go back to the sponsoring state and harm them. Um, there's a possible uh, negative uh, cost for the long-term reputation of the sponsor due to the brutality or the uh, very extreme method that some of the terror groups operate. So again, this is a lot of cost to pay and seriously harm the long-term interest of uh, the sponsoring country in terms of, for example, losing the local support in this, in this specific uh, country. So again, a lot of uh, potential um, damages for uh, the, the sponsoring state. And the question here is, why would they do that? A similar question can be raised when we're thinking about it from the group's perspective. Why would a group decide to uh, seek for sponsors? So um, the main reason why it's kind of uh, unclear is that there are potential restrictions on their freedom of action to accomplish their own strategic goal. So once the group is under the sponsorship of a state, it might be 
uh, under some kind of limitation to what it can do, what it cannot do, based on what the state uh, allows it to do. Um, another risk is that the state may expel or stop its support for the groups if it's become on its own threat. So if a state sponsors a terror group and then at some uh, point the operations of the group become uh, too risky for the sponsoring state, they might expel the group from its own area, they might stop sponsoring it. And the example in this case is the PLO and Jordan following the 67 wars. So the PLO uh, conducted most of their attacks in the late 1960s from a basis in Jordan. But uh, at some point, uh, the group began to adopt a much more autonomous actions, not just directed by Jordan. And those uh, represented a threat for the Jordan monarchy. And that ended actually with what is known as Black September in 1970, when the Jordan, when the Jordan uh, army uh, clashed with uh, militants from the PLO. There was a lot of casualties in those attacks. And eventually, the PLO was expelled from Jordan to uh, Lebanon. So uh, that's uh, the perspective of the terror group. Before we begin going a little bit deeper into uh, this uh, issue, well, let's talk about uh, definition. So first of all, similar to the overall discussion, and I've mentioned that a lot of time over the last uh, uh, weeks, is terrorism has no consensus definition. We adopted one based on the book, but overall, uh, state sponsorship also doesn't have a consensus definition. The bottom line when we're thinking about state sponsorship is that we're thinking about the role played by state that supports on some level, there can be different types of uh, support, we'll talk about that in a minute, some kind of uh, non-state entity that conducts acts of uh, transnational terrorism. So that's the definition for us. State, spo state sponsorship can be materialized as uh, in different versions. For example, a state will establish a terror group because it wants it to serve as an agent, as a proxy that will spread some of its goals or uh, uh, implement some of its goals in another location. And the prime example for that is the Hezbollah uh, establishing, uh, uh, Hez Hezbollah was established by Iran in the, in the 1980s in Lebanon and have been sponsored by Iran since then and uh, it has promoted a lot of the Iranian goals. And the last thing in this case is we need to remember that state sponsorship, although like a lot of terrorism over the last 15 to 20 years, which see mostly like an Arab issue or an Islamic kind of terrorism, is not necessarily that because the operations by the bus group from ETA in northern Spain has been supported not explicitly, but a lot implicitly by the French in their operation against Spanish. And the entire uh, saga of the uh, Iran contrast with the US support for uh, this terror group in Nicaragua in the 1980s. So it's not just an Arab issue, though there's evidence for state sponsorship of terrorism throughout the globe. The next uh, part that I want to talk about is that there are different types uh, of supporters, there are different types of state actors that support. Uh, uh, terrorism, so we distinguish among types based on their capability and how likely they are to prevent attacks by the groups that they are sponsoring. So there's a different typologies for that. So I'm going to use the Bingman one. So there are four different types of support. The first one is what's called aggressive supporters. Those are states which have high capacity, but, and, but at the same time, they also are great supporters of terrorism that serve as their agent. And uh, one of the reasons that state will do that because that uh, allows them to uh, solve those asymmetric conditions versus another state rival. So if they are relatively weak compared to another state, they can use those terror groups in order to, uh, uh, in order to uh, overcome those asymmetric conditions between Iran, in this case is the example, and other states. So again, the Iranian support for Hezbollah and Hamas is intended in some ways to compensate for its asymmetric conditions versus the United States and Israel. So this is just one example for that, but this is one group of supporters, aggressive countries which have high capacity, and they're also great supporters of terrorism. At the same time, we have strong actors who oppose terrorism. Those are also high capacity actors, but those actually either reject the use of terrorism or at the very least they remain neutral in this case. Uh, the example for that is the Americans, uh, relatively implicit support or 
uh, remaining neutral, neutral whatever it comes to uh, the operations by the provisional IRA in Ireland. That happened all, all the way through the mid 2000s. The, the United States have uh, ignored the fact that uh, a lot of the uh, Irish operators have smuggled weapons from the United States to uh, their area of operations in Northern Ireland. So that's another example. The third group is what's called weak supporters. Those are actors who don't have a lot of capabilities, they're relatively weak actors, but uh, they are supporters of terrorism. So the problem that they're facing in many cases is that they cannot actually uh, expel the terror group if they want to. And the prime example for that is uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan. So the Taliban is one of the factions that fought in the uh, civil war in Afghanistan in the 1990s. It, uh, at the end of the war, it ended as the strongest group after this a bloody civil war in the early 1990s. And as part of its uh, uh, consolidating control in, Afghan in Afghanistan, it allowed uh, Al-Qaeda uh, to settle in Afghanistan in 1996. Uh, pretty quickly, Al-Qaeda began to operate independently and to gain much uh, strength with its attack against the West and the United States mostly uh, after 9-11. Uh, when it was clear that Al-Qaeda uh, was the perpetrator of the attack, uh, the Taliban refused to turn over bin Laden. It can be because uh, the Taliban felt some allegiance to uh, bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, and their goals, but it also can be just like this uh, specific type of uh, state-sponsored is uh, described here. They were just not, didn't have the capacity. They were unable to actually uh, catch bin Laden and hand it over to the West or to the American. So that's just another example for that. The last group in this case is uh, weak actors who oppose terrorism. So those are actors who not, not only are weak from, a, um, from their capability standpoint, they also are opposing. So they cannot actually uh, confront or expel terror groups, but they don't also have uh, uh, the power. And the example for that include the Iraq with uh, Al-Qaeda uh, in Iraq, which turned out to be ISIS eventually. They were unable to, uh, to, actually, to uh, confront Al-Qaeda in Iraq until they got a substantial support from the United States. Another example is Somalia, who cannot address the threat posed by Al-Shabaab. Reminding you, Al-Shabaab is the local affiliate of Al-Qaeda in East Africa or in uh, Somalia. Uh, some of those examples, especially over the last uh, two groups, the weak supporters and the weak actors who oppose terrorism, also show how there can be state support, which is actually what can be termed as inadvent inadvertent support. Those are weak actors who are trying to get as much uh, support, external support. The actors themselves, the countries themselves are looking for support from the global community as much as they can because they, have, uh, they are very weak from a capacity standpoint, uh, just like the structural factor we talked about. Uh, this allows the terror groups to operate in their areas, uh, but because they're also uh, the issue of uh, they're arguing that they will fight against terrorism, so they're able to grant uh, support and aid from uh, strong actors around the globe. So, prime example for this example for this uh, type of uh, supporter is Pakistan after 9/11. Uh, Pakistan after 9/11 joined the United States in its combat uh, of Al Qaeda. It was able to secure uh, an extensive amount of military intelligence and financial aid from the United States. But there's a lot of people that argue that it did not use those funds to combat Al-Qaeda. And in many cases, it actually harbored many of its supporters, mostly within its intelligence services. So this is the weak actors and how they may not always uh, directly support terrorism and how they will be able to gain from that while they're still supporting uh, terrorism. All right, so the first classification that I talked about was the different types of uh, supporters of terrorism. Now I want to talk about different types of support. What exactly is space state sponsorship? How does that materialize? So the most obvious example is what's called sanctuary, and that's uh, providing safe haven for the group. It allows us to train, to uh, make its preparation, to plot its operation, and uh, conduct a lot of recruitment. Uh, because the group is in, in the area of the sponsor state, it is actually protected for any kind of foreign intervention. It allows them to focus on more recruitment and planning on future attacks. 
uh, in turn, that actually represents for the terror group incentives to seek that support. For example, uh, the FLN, the group in Algeria, established uh, many of its forward bases in Tunisia, who is the neighbor of Algeria. And during the revolution in Algeria, which happened between uh, 1954 and 1960, they were able to conduct most of their attacks from Tunisia, mostly because uh, the French were unwilling to engage in military attacks in Tunisia. So it provided a lot of operational benefits for the rebel group, the FLN. So this is just one example how sanctuary is beneficial for the group and how they may seek that in uh, other countries. Another uh, um, central form of uh, state sponsorship is providing all kinds of uh, resources such as money, uh, weaponry, logistical support. So money is a very critical component for the daily operations of uh, terror groups. And we'll talk about that in one of the, the, next, the following lectures when we talk about the uh, financing of terrorism, but money allows groups to run operations, to pay the recruits, to purchase weapons, technologies, all kinds of transportation equipment. Um, establish effective propaganda platforms, all those kinds are based on money and uh, all kinds of logistical support that the state who sponsors the terrorism is able to provide. And the prime example, again coming back, is the Iranian support for uh, Hezbollah, which uh, allowed the uh, terror group a lot of freedom to concentrate on its operations and less on finding uh, financial support. Uh, for example, in 1996, Iran provided uh, planes full of weapons as well as over $100 million uh, to support Hezbollah and its uh, extended political and social influence in Lebanon, just as one example. There are also examples for more specific types of logistical support for specific uh, cases or incidents. So Idi Amin, which was the president of Uganda in the 1970s, uh, provided a place for uh, the group called Black September who hijacked Air France flight that uh, originated in Europe and was intended to go to Tel Aviv. That, all that uh, happened in 1976. So the Ugandan uh, dictator uh, back in that incident provided, other than providing them a place to uh, land the airplane to conduct all their demands, he also provided them with weapons and some of his uh, military personnel to carry out their mission. Uh, this incident, I've mentioned that uh, a few times, ended with the uh, Israeli hostage uh, mission hostage uh, operation, hostage rescue operation in July of 1976. But again, this is just one incident of how some countries can provide some specific support for uh, terror groups in their attacks. Other uh, types of uh, state sponsorship of what is exactly does it mean, state sponsorship. So um, some supporters allow groups access to advanced training facilities or they actually train themselves. And the American uh, used to train a lot of the Central, Amer um, Central American paramilitaries in uh, combat techniques and intelligence techniques. They also provide this access to intelligence about their adversaries, so that provides other benefits to the terror group uh, when they are under the sponsorship of some uh, powerful uh, state. Organizational assistance is a more mostly relevant in the early stages when the group is being established because it allows them to close some of those information gaps on how to direct volunteers to join, how to, uh, the, it, it's related to the conduct of leaders and how to diffuse some of those inner group uh, rivalries that usually are more prevalent early on. Uh, two more types of uh, sponsorship include uh, diplomatic support. So uh, the prime examples for that is the support that the Arab countries are providing to uh, uh, the PLO in its struggle with, uh, with Israel. And the main implication of this kind of sponsorship is that it provides more legitimacy for uh, the claims of the terror group. Uh, a more wider scale uh, types of sponsorship in this case comes with the inspiration or ideolo ideological uh, guidance. Uh, the examples for that, the more uh, older example is the Soviets who provided a lot of this ideological guidance to the left-wing terror groups in Europe during the Cold War or all the guidance that uh, Iran has provided uh, for Islamic groups uh, across the globe. So that is uh, another type of sponsorship. Now, this is the first half or a little bit over the first half of this, of our uh, uh, lecture. What I'm gonna do in the remaining uh, time is go over what, we'll go with, what, what we did, like we talked about suicide terrorism and other types, I'm gonna go over the different uh, theoretical approaches that we've talked about early on in the semester and try to explain 
a sponsorship of terrorism based on that. So we'll start with the strategic approach, uh, focusing, as you probably remember, uh, on utility maximization and making rational decisions. So how is it rational to sponsor uh, terrorism? So uh, mainly it is, can be seen as a power maximization tactic which is very cost effective. So the costs are very, very low relatively for the ability to maximize the power of the, um, the power of the uh, sponsor state. It serves as a covert method to advance the sponsor's goals. And it offers it what can be termed as a plausible deniability regarding its involvement with the operations of the terror group. So it reduces the risk for retaliation, whether it is a military retaliation, economic, or any kind of other retaliation, by a more powerful state against them. So again, supporting the terror group in this case provides it the ability to covertly advance some of its goal while reducing the risk of severe retaliation. And one example for that is the Iraqi support for the group MEK. It's called the Mujahideen Helic, which is a group which uh, resisted the Iranian, uh, the Iranian leadership. Uh, throughout the uh, 1980s, mostly late 70s and throughout the 1980s, all the way to 2001. So Iraq provided weapons and sanctuary for that group. And in return, that group supported uh, the uh, regime by Saddam Hussein by uh, focusing and uh, attacking any kind of internal opposition uh, in Iraq. So this is just uh, one example. Another uh, uh, explanation that related to uh, the strategic approach is the idea to project power from a global standpoint. So a state that wants to project its power beyond its immediate border uh, can use terror group in order to do that. It is a rational, rash, realist perspective, actors in the international system uh, that need to operate, operate within the overall balance of power. So you want to project more power externally beyond, beyond your immediate neighborhood, so you use a terror group for that. Uh, the example, again, is Iran using Hezbollah uh, versus Israel in the United States. At the same time, just as we talked about with the strategic approach, uh, counter evidence for this will talk about mostly the cost that states suffer. I've mentioned a lot of them early on. States are suffering a substantially uh, an insignificant amount of cost but usually they persist. So Iran suffered a lot of costs based on its support in terrorism. It still persisted in that. So again, we have to think about how is that fits into this rational uh, calculation. And, and that's something uh, that uh, we can talk about. Next in line is the uh, ideological approach. So the focus in this case is how do different belief system ideologies, uh, usually focusing on regional or global dominance and how that provides an explanation for sponsoring terrorism. And to understand that, it's easier to think about it as an example. The Saudis have, over the years, have provided kind of an implicit or silent support for ISIS and its operation as part of the global jihad movement. And the main reason for that is a lot of the interest of ISIS align with those of the uh, uh, Saudi regime with respect to the more fundamentalist radical version of Islam. So uh, that's one interpretation and why the Saudi Arabia provides a silent support for a lot of those radical uh, Islamic groups. Now, an actor that is committed to a sponsor terrorism, mostly based on a ideology, is very hard, hard to uh, counter or to stop him from that. And there's a couple of ways that, there's a couple of studies that offered some potential actions, for example, uh, we can contain those sponsors by isolating them. That means that we can identify uh, state actors and contain their ability by isolating them with travel bans and uh, financial freezes and assets. That's, more, that's both physical and economical restrictions that try to uh, deter states from sponsoring terrorism based on their ideology. If we can recognize that the motivation is more prestige and less ideology, then we can remove those uh, benefits of being uh, the status of uh, and the benefits of being a member of the global community by preventing them from uh, participating in global events such as a G g7 or removing them from international organizations so those are kind of actions that are intended to again increase the cost for the sponsoring state so they'll decide that they do not want 
uh, to sponsor terrorism anymore, especially when it comes to uh, the same ideology. And in this case, uh, one of the interesting uh, problems in this case is that in many cases, uh, the support of state is not necessarily some kind of ideology. So the support that Iran provides to Hamas fits much more to a strategic explanation rather than ideological explanation because Iran is a Shia country, Shia Arab country, and Hamas is actually a supporter of the Sunni uh, Muslim sect. And that's a pretty big uh, gap between those. So it's hard to uh, use the Islamic ideology or some version of the Islamic ideology to explain why Iran supports Hamas. So that's why, uh, in this case, this type of explanation uh, may, may not hold. Uh, staying within those a uh, lower level explanation, we'll talk about the psychological approach and how that explains uh, support for uh, terrorism. So first of all, the applicability of the, uh, this approach depends on the way that we conceptualize sponsorship, whether we look at that as a decision by individual leader or whether we think about that in the context of a group that decides to support a terror group. So if we're looking at the individual leader, the prime example for that is Gaddafi, who supported a lot of terror groups over the 1980s and 90s. And part of the explanation for that in the individual level is a lot of his personality uh, and psychological traits, uh, such as narcissism, intense paranoia, and all those things, which led him to support other groups that will, again, show that he's much more powerful and display him in a much more positive sense in the global community. That was part of his perception. When we're thinking about it in the group, group context, we can go back to the main mechanism that we've talked about uh, in the psychological approach in a group context, which was the group thinking. So uh, the uh, establishment of Hezbollah was a decision by the radical cler clerics in Iraq, which is a group of radical uh, leaders in uh, Iran, I'm sorry, not Iraq, and their decision to establish and support uh, Hezbollah. And uh, when this, uh, such a decision is taken in a tight group, such as those groups, then the mechanism of a uh, group thing uh, kicks into play. And then there's very low chances of any kind of countering opinion, somebody raising the potential risk of this kind of decision, it actually makes an effect on the eventual decision. The problem and the issue with the psychological approach, as always, is lack of data. It's very hard to find evidence to support that as individual leaders, such as Gaddafi, we know that he had a lot of personality issues. We don't know if that necessarily was the case. It's hard to find evidence that shows that that was the reason for uh, his support of terrorism. We need to have information. We have evidence in terms of private records of leaders talking about their views of sponsorship or and also the ability to assess their psychological state. So the issue, again, is a lack of data. Okay, before I move on to the uh, next slide, I will stop here to provide you with the uh, attendance word of today. Uh, it seems to be working pretty well so far, so we'll go on with that. Today's attendance words is snow, such as snow falling from the sky. So uh, once you finish uh, listening to this lecture, send me the email with the attendance word of today, which is snow. All right, moving on. Uh, next approach, in this case, we go back up the level of analysis to uh, the structural approach. So what we're trying to understand here is identify those macro level conditions that makes it, makes it rational and make, and sure that, and make it uh, reasonable for us that states will decide to sponsor terror groups despite the associated risks. So we'll look at the two prime uh, structural uh, factors in this case that we've mentioned early on. The number one, the first one is the uh, state capacity. So uh, weak states can benefit from sponsorship when they're hosting groups. Uh, this uh, benefits can sometimes can be actually inadvertent. As I've mentioned earlier, uh, the example is Pakistan and the support that they got from the American. Well, they were uh, cooperating with the United States in its fight against Al-Qaeda, but actually also harboring a lot of terrorists. So they got the aid from the Americans, but they were still uh, able to uh, sponsor uh, terrorism in this case. So that was beneficial uh, to them. Clear state capacity structural uh, explanation. Uh, in this case, another reason for weak states to uh, sponsor terror groups is again, coming back to this uh, power projection, it allows them to indirectly uh, project their power uh, and uh, <clears throat> mostly because they're not they're less uh, they're less accommodating to uh, directly confront other more powerful actor and the example in this case is again Pakistan but in this case in its relationship with India 
instead of uh, risking a direct war with India, Pakistan actually prefer to uh, support a lot of the terror groups operated from its border and targeting India instead of going to direct war with it, more powerful country. So that's how state capacity provides some kind of rational explanation for why uh, countries will support uh, terror groups. The second uh, primary uh, structural factor in this case is regime type. Regime type uh, with respect to uh, what kind of uh, countries, what kind of regimes are more likely to uh, sponsor terrorism or not. So two democracies that have some kind of a disagreement between one another are less likely to use those kinds of groups uh, using uh, proxy violent access to resolve their differences uh, because they are more likely to rely on the existing institutional or diplomatic mechanisms. For example, if the United States and Canada has some kind of dispute dispute amongst them, not going to use violence in order to resolve that dispute, they're going to go to all kinds of existing uh, institutions that uh, exist between them. But when we have countries with different regimes, so democracies and autocracies or diff two different types of autocracies that are lacking those kinds of channels between them, they're more likely to turn to violence in the form of terrorism in order to address those kinds of disputes. Uh, so that's that's one explanation. That's why uh, autocratic regimes have another uh, dispute with other autocratic regimes. They don't have the ability to actually directly communicate with the other countries. So they will use just violence in order to uh, trying to address those kinds of problems. Now, as always, there's uh, while structural conditions provide us a pretty powerful explanation in this case, they also have a lot of issues. So. Some of the problems with the structural explanation comes back to uh, some of the criticism or the limitations that I've mentioned when I talked about the structural explanation to terrorism as a whole. Uh, for example, uh, the first one is that inability to uh, explain those variations uh, across countries with similar conditions. So Colombia and Pakistan, both of them are relatively weak actors but Pakistan is considered as one of the um, primary examples for state sponsors of terrorism, Colombia is not. And so state capacity in this case does not allow us to explain why one country is uh, supporting terrorism while the other isn't. So that's um, one problem with that. It also does not provide us a sufficient explanation to why the powerful countries support terrorism. For example, why does the United States support it uh, the Contras in their struggle in Central America. Why did the United States support the Mujahideen in Afghanistan? And that's problematic to think about it in the context, again, of the structural explanation. We can think about a lot of other explanations, like it's mostly a strategic explanation in its power struggle with the Russians in this uh, case, but this is not a structural explanation, it's a strategic explanation. And that's the problem in this case. Uh, I remind you again that one of the main problems that structural explanations had was with regarding to uh, timing. Structural explanations are slow to change. They're relatively static. So they cannot explain why do state decide to sponsor terrorism for some time and then decide to stop that sponsorship. And that comes back to uh, the example of, the Jor uh, of Jordan, which supported the Palestinian terrorism for a few years since the PLO was established in the late 1960s until it stopped that support. And not only that, got into a pretty severe, a violent uh, conflict with those terror groups in Jordan in 1970, led to, the, uh, uh, led to expelling those groups from the, the territory of Jordan. So that's something that we cannot use a structural explanation such as the capacity of the uh, state to explain. Jordan was relatively weak in the 1960s. It was relatively, uh, also relatively weak in 1970. Why did it stop supporting? A group such as a PLO in that case. Uh, so those are the uh, approaches. Uh, as you can see, I didn't go over all of them. Uh, the book talks a little bit about more, but now I want to talk uh, about uh, policy uh, options uh, based on the way that's uh, in our view of why states sponsor terrorism. I provided different explanations. Uh, we can think about two primary strategies to counter that, and both of those strategies are intended to raise the costs for uh, states that uh, sponsor terrorism and persuade them that their support for terrorism is not just not worth it. So the first one is military action. In this case, this is a retaliation using military, uh, an offensive retaliation using military force 
uh, in response to those terror attacks. The target is the terror group, of course, but also the host state. Uh, so that's something that which is pretty prevalent and we have a lot of examples for that. I'll give you some of them. For example, Israel tend to do that a lot of time, also with Jordan in the 1960s for its uh, support of the Palestinian group. Uh, one of those attacks was a raid in 1968, but uh, the outcome in this case for Israel, from Israel's standpoint, was a blowback. And I've talked about terrorism blows back. As you remember that he, uh, the group, that the state initiates a counterterrorism um, policy in order to reduce the extent of terrorism, but instead it actually turns out to be more uh, costly. So from a military standpoint, Israel was able in that specific raid to destroy all the military bases of the PLO in that area. But at the same time, it attracted a substantial amount of global criticism for a disproportionate response for terror attacks. And eventually it actually increased the global sympathy for the Palestinian cause. So for Israel, it was not as uh, effective in this case. A more uh, contemporary example, of course, is the American invasion to Afghanistan in October 2001. Uh, the main objective was to deny Al Qaeda its safe haven that was uh, it allowed it was uh, granted in uh, in Afghanistan. I'm sorry, and also remove the uh, Taliban to punish it by removing it from power for uh, its harboring of Bin Laden. Now, from a military standpoint, it was a military success because in the short term, the United States was able to uh, remove the Taliban from power, and in, after a few not a long time, relatively most of the Al-Qaeda uh, presence in Afghanistan was reduced. But over the long haul, Al-Qaeda was able to resurgence and we're still in, Af in Al-Qaeda in, sorry, uh, we're still in Afghanistan today uh, more than uh, 19 years after the attack. So uh, we can talk and really debate whether this was actually a success when you think about that. So that's a uh, military action. Those are some of the examples for uh, the outcomes in this case. The second, uh, the second uh, policy action is, uh, mil this is uh, different economic and uh, diplomatic measures in terms of sanctions. Again, focusing on uh, punish the sponsors of terrorism and persuade them that it's just not worth it. So again, is a kind of example, Libya was included on the American uh, state sponsor list since the late 1970s until 2003 for its support of terrorism throughout this time. In 1986, the Reagan administration imposed uh, sanctions in terms of the exports and imports uh, due to its uh, support for uh, terrorism over those years. In 1988, after Gaddafi refused to extradite two suspects in the Pan American flight attack, remember uh, over Lockerbie in Scotland in 1988, uh, the UN uh, added to the American sanctions by increasing some of those uh, sanctions on Libya with a petroleum and arm embargo and arms embargo which completely had a very strong effect on uh, Libya, Libya's ability to conduct any kinds of uh, business. It had a substantial effect uh, on uh, Libya and led to, its, to a relatively reduction in its extent of support. At the same time, there's other uh, countries which have been more resistant to such measures. And the prime example for that is Sudan, which uh, is yet to comply with some, several of the uh, United Nations resolutions about expediting some of the suspects in events such as the assassination attempt of former Egyptian president Hosni Mubarak in 1995, or its support for uh, Al-Qaeda, of course, and Bin Laden. Another example for a country who's been resistant to such measures is, of course, in North Korea. So this is the uh, talk about uh, state sponsorship of terrorism, reminding you again uh, to uh, send me the email about the attendance, and you will get later on today the additional uh, video about uh, the final uh, paper and final presentation. I will see all of you uh, later this week. Bye.